Hello and welcome to your mid-month update, where we do a deeper dive into Cardano development and delivery. With no further ado, let's meet the crew. Now we've got Nigel, we've got Kevin and we've got John to tell us a little bit more. Nigel, let's start with you. February, a busy month. As always, Tim, I think it's worth just taking a moment before we dive in and just reiterating and explaining again how we've matured as a company to do major releases this year. So we we concentrated this year to focus on three major release months so that we've got fixed dates for the end of February, end of June and the end of October. Now, this is really important and I think this is a big step forward for us as a company because it enables everybody that's involved in our ecosystem all our downstream applications and products, an indication of when they might have to do an update to their particular pieces of software. So it also means that for us internally, um, on our core infrastructure, we've got our engineers that are focusing on these different dates and understand and can actually develop, ideate, test and address uh, the challenges as we go through and build towards these key releases that come through. Okay, great. Thanks, Nigel. So maybe let's just dive straight in and you can take us through some of the contents of that release. Sure. We're highlighting some of the key features that we're including. A lot of it is focused once again on improving our network performance, but we're also building more and more out in terms of our smart contract offering. So improving our smart contract ecosystem, infrastructure work, DAP test tooling, and all sorts of other bits and pieces that the DAP developers and community will use um, going forwards as, as they build out all of their exciting new applications. As we step through well, everything in February, Kevin and John will bring in all the different technical detail. And then after that, we'll give you a sneak peek of what we're, uh, what we're planning to do in June. So let's, let's just jump in. Let's have a look at the core platform. We start off with one of the first things that's, that's included into the major release at the end of February. The node release in um, 1.33 did include a lot of this data structure mapping and redesign, which has improved the sync times for uh, Deadless and a number of uh, the other applications that are running on the network. The node release 1.34 builds on all the good work that we've done with 1.33, um, but here to tell us a bit more is Kevin. Thanks, Nigel. So a uh, huge shout out to the Node team. They've been doing a tremendous amount of work here to make uh, everyone's uh, lives uh, better through imp improving the performance of the Node. And we've been seeing uh, huge strides uh, forward there. Uh, there are some big improvements that have been made, uh, in particular to the uh, memory representation that the Node uses, about 12 altogether. We've got a new, more compact data format. Uh, we have smaller transaction inputs and outputs in memory. Uh, snapshots are using more compact representation and uh, values are being shared during deserialization. And all this means not only less memory usage, uh, but also, very importantly, a faster node. And that's what we're all uh, focusing on uh, at the moment, improving the overall performance and experience for our user base. There is one wrinkle with this, which is that the first time uh, you use the new version of the node, you may experience uh, a slightly longer than usual uh, resynchronization time. That's only a one-off. And there's a new version of Daedalus, Daedalus Flight, uh, which aims to uh, make that more obvious to the user. So you should get better information about exactly what is going on uh, under the hood as you use the new versions of Daedalus. Uh, but uh, maybe I should hand over to John, who's going to tell us a bit about our new CDDL format. When you have um, data in a computer's memory, it tends to be instantiated is the word, or when, when it's created, it lives uh, as an object or a structure. And there are various formats for how um, data lives in a computer's RAM when it's being used by the program that's created it. It turns out though, the way computers store data when they're executing is not necessarily a great way to store data um, when you're trying to move it across the network. So when we want to take some, some data out of the computer's memory and, and pass it on to our neighbor, as we do when we're propagating blocks in the blockchain um, or other messages across the network, it's important that we take the representation out of the computer's memory and uh, go through a process which is known as serialization in order to take that data uh, object and represent it in a way that is efficient for transport. Um, so the serialization approach we take is known as CBOR, which stands for a concise binary object representation. 
And it's loosely based on JSON, which folks may know from web development. Um, this idea that you have text-based key value pairs, but Seabor uses a binary format, so it's represented as pure ones and zeros. So the change that we've made in particular is to CDDL. And CDDL is concise data definition language. And really, you can think of it like a schema for Seabor. So we've tried to tighten up the schema for our underlying uh, serialization representation. And ultimately, what all of this means is that when we're sending data across the network, uh, we do so more efficiently and, and in, in a more compact way. OK, thanks, John. Um, next up is to be looking at the, uh, the future of our uh, wallet infrastructure. Um, and I know we've made a lot of advances and, and um, improvements in that area. To start off with, to improve the functionality in any of the front end products, we have to look at improving the, the infrastructure. So we're introducing the infrastructure uh, capability for multi-signature this time around at the end of February. Um, and this will incorporate the ability for parties to be able to uh, complete transactions with multi-signatures, which might be used to validate transactions, votes, or many other contracts or other possibilities. Kevin, can you help us to understand the other benefits that we can get from this? Multisig is a really cool feature. We've we've had it around um, since um, Shelley as as a standalone feature. Uh, there's new capability uh, in Plutus, of course. And basically, what Multisig is all about is for two parties to a transaction to both agree uh, that the transaction is valid. So this allows you uh, to, uh, for example, have two people signing off on a payment uh, transaction or for uh, two parties to agree uh, that some contract has been fulfilled. All, all these kinds of things. Very, very useful uh, feature from the real world perspective. And what we've been doing in the node um, is to improve that uh, capability. So there's been work on enhancing the way that signatures are done uh, from within the node. So this makes it easier for people to use the multi-sig capability. In addition to, to the improvements we've got on multi-sig, we also introduced a reporting uh, benefit and feature uh, via the leadership schedule. And this enables us to actually get visibility of which SP SPOs are going to be producing the blocks next um, and helps us to be able to report on it, which is useful if you're a DAP developer to see what transactions are getting processed and if there is a possibility that you might need to resubmit a transaction. But it's not just that. In terms of the core platform development, we've also been looking at our smart contract capabilities and we've got some cool new features as well coming out from that area. Yeah, so one of the things to highlight is uh, local transaction monitoring, Nigel. And this, this came out of discussions uh, that happened at the Cardano Summit uh, last year. Uh, so brilliant event, by the way. Uh, lots of community engagement, people getting together, uh, focusing on developing uh, new ideas, IO engineers working with the community um, and bringing out some really good things, of which, of course, some people receive prizes. So guys, participate in this. Don't just sit back, join in, do things. There's opportunity, there are opportunities there uh, for you to make a real difference to the community. So what is local transaction monitoring? Well, this is one of the things that um, people have really been looking for. It's quite a simple idea. Essentially, what you need, what you want is some capability to say, has the node processed a transaction without having to wait for this to pop up in the chain and figure out has your transaction gone through or not? So the local transaction monitoring lets people study the mempool content, lets you see what transactions are being processed by the node, tells you instantly, yes, this has been processed, or no, it's not yet in the mempool. And then you can write applications on top of that uh, that um, do more sophisticated things. So it's a great capability. It's To be honest, it's not very complex. Uh, it's a relatively small piece of development. So even small things can be really, really useful, guys. This, this really makes a difference. And it's been incorporated now um, as part of the Ogmios uh, framework. So you can, if you're using Ogmios, uh, you can pick up on this capability. You can use it uh, there. So, of course, in addition, uh, Nigel, we should also discuss the auto calculations 
for Plutus Scripts. Would you like to give us an update on that? Sure, Kevin. Um, this is a feature that we had when we first launched uh, Alonzo. And what we've done is we've listened to the community and we've been able to actually improve on it. And that release is going out at the end of February as well. So it's just as a reminder, it's uh, an auto calculation tool to be able to understand the transaction size for Plutus Scripts, which is incredibly helpful if you're a DAP developer, because then you can understand how you're going to get things onto the chain and actually how your DAP is going to perform and how many things you can fit into a block um, and all, all the other things that you need to do as a DAP developer. So last but not least, parameter updates. Now, John, you've been managing this program and these improvements to the network, steady and sure, but perhaps you can give us an update on what's happening next. Absolutely. So uh, 2022, uh, is all about scaling out layer one on Cardano, and I've mentioned that before. So let me just remind viewers what we've done already. We started off at 64 kilobyte blocks. We moved to 72, and then more recently to 80 kilobytes. So we've already made substantial size improvements to the block size. Um, and then in terms of Plutus, Plutus requires resources, um, both computational or CPU units and memory uh, uh, units in order to do useful things with a Plutus script. We started off with 10 million units on Plutus. We moved to 11.25 million, 12.5 million, and more recently to 14 million. So we've literally had a 40% increase in terms of the resources, memory resources, I should say, available to Plutus scripts. So lots of quite serious improvements there to layer one. We're going today to post another change to the, to the network parameters of mainnet. We're now going to focus on block level limits. So when I looked before, I spoke about uh, block size, I spoke about memory limits. Those memory limits were per transaction. And of course, we also have per block limits in both our uh, CPU units and in memory units. So we're going to raise the per block level limits so that folks can not only write scripts that do more, but can put more of those scripts into our now bigger blocks. Talking of parameters, John, another area of fairly intense discussion amongst the SPO community has been around the decentralization parameters. And I understand that's something we're also looking at very, very closely now. Absolutely, Tim. We had a call recently with over 250 SPOs. And it was really a learning experience for me. It was the first time that I had FaceTime with so many of them. Um, we're listening at IO. We understand that we, that we have concerns in the community about certain decentralization parameters. And in the coming weeks, um, we're going to provide further feedback and clarity on what we do next with these parameters. So Nigel, rather than going too deep into what's coming in June, perhaps we can just do a bit of a thousand, uh, a thousand metre view for now, or a thousand yard, depending on where you're watching this from, just to give people a little bit of a taste about what we'll be going into in more detail in future shows. Sure. Thanks, Tim. I'll just bring up what we're looking at for the June hard fork. We've named it uh, uh, Vazel. This is our major release for the end of June. There's lots of good stuff to look forward to in the June major release. We've got a lot more work that's going on for the, the Plutus optimization work, which is going to really help the DAP development community. And also we've got some really exciting things around the network efficiency and the much awaited uh, pipelining feature. So rather than do a deep dive into it right now, we'll be saving that up for the end of the month 360. OK, thank you very much, Nigel. And uh, as Nigel says, we'll have lots more information about what's happening in uh, between now and June and, of course, in the June hard fork in future editions of the show. We also had a chance this month to meet with the Hydra team. Hello everybody, I'm Sebastian, a developer and technical manager on Hydra here at IOG. I'm happy to be here. Hello guys, my uh, name is Matthias. I'm also working on the Hydra project, doing the bridge between the research and engineering with Sebastian. So Matthias, uh, you've Oops. recently published a blog post to give an update on the progress of Hydra and also bust a few myths and misconceptions. Perhaps you can tell us a bit more about that. Yes, indeed. So we wanted to write this blog post for quite a long time to give some status update on you know, what we're doing, where we're at, where we're aiming at with this project, uh, but also to address a few, a few concerns we had from you know, observing people talking in the community and social medias and, and saying things about Hydra. So about those things, right? We, we've seen a lot of this 1 million TPS being called out all over the place. And we've been talking about TPS several times already, saying that it's not really a good measure to comparing blockchain right? because the blockchains, all of them have a very different way of defining a transaction. So a transaction on Cardano is not the same as a transaction on you know, another platform. And even transactions within Cardano are already very, very different, right? Smart contract transaction versus uh, just you know pure payment transaction is, is it's quite different. So it's not really good for looking at things. Plus, um, in the case of Hydra, right? 
Hydra is very similar to having mini ledgers that are quite isolated from one another, right? So looking at all those ledgers and summing up all the possible TPS of all those independent ledgers together, and you, know, you can really reach it any numbers you want, right? One million, one billion, you know, whatever you call it. So we don't really like looking at that. And we think it's much better to look at things like the settlement time of a transaction, for instance, or the actual amount of data that is being transferred over a period of time. And these sort of, of benchmarks are much more useful to us and, and meaningful as well. Uh, second, right, we also wanted to address the fact that Hydra is not only about SPOs, and actually that SPOs are probably the less likely candidates to be running Hydra Head in the first place, right? A Hydra Head is, is, is something that anyone can really run. Might it be someone with his Daedalus wallet or a light wallet provider or even service provider, like, you know, you name it. So we really wanted to, to make that clear that this is not just an SPO thing. This is a broader construct, a, a tool and we want to encourage people to build this infrastructure of layer two solution on top of Cardano using Hydra Heads. So Sebastian, you've also recently published the Hydra Roadmap. Perhaps you want to dig deep into that and tell us a little bit about the uh, the progress there. Of course, Tim. In terms of the roadmap, we want to be transparent as well. So this is why we opened up what we internally uh, planned out to be essential steps on a high level uh, across uh, maturing what we have right now from a developer preview as it was in September over uh, first prototypes, really making it mature it more, uh, make it capable to run on the f on the Cardano testnet and, and eventually reach mainnet maturity. The public roadmap is available on GitHub. Uh, you can see on, on this dimension, for example, how, how multiple features actually comprise new releases. Uh, we have even made a recent release, 103, and uh, you might want to check out all the descriptions on what we do, what we added, what we changed. And there will be many more releases along as we, as we mature the, the Hydra head or the Hydra node capable of Hydra head protocol further along until eventually 1.0, of course. This is something we want to do because really to be transparent what we're building, what we're working on, and even discuss with the community and how, pr how important some features are for, for one or the other use case. In the beginning, it's of course, most of the things are essential, right? But as we further progress along, uh, many of the extensions of the advanced protocols, which are based on, on Hydra head are up for discussion. And we gladly do that on, on open platforms like GitHub and also other channels. And of course, the community contribution to the project is going to be key going forwards as well. Perhaps you want to tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, as can be demonstrated here already with GitHub uh, roadmaps, right? We also have like GitHub discussions. Um, we have a Discord channel, uh, which is the, on our IOG technical server. Um, you can ask Hydra, it's the channel's name. You can ask anything. If you want to be informed on a high level, you can point it to resources, to our documentation maybe, or uh, people also educate themselves uh, uh, there. Uh, of course, there's also a stack exchange. You can ask more concrete uh, questions you have while even trying out our code base, and which we very much encourage, right? So it's really... We want to take you on this journey and all, all together build uh, a scalability solution for Cardano. So we'll have a lot more from Matthias and Sebastian over the months ahead to keep you fully up to date with what's happening with Hydra. If you want to read that blog post, make sure you check out the link in the show notes before. We'll also have a demo for you. So keep an eye on our social channels and we'll share that as soon as it's available. So gentlemen, thank you very much for joining. Any final thoughts before we let you go? Maybe we want to just remind people that what you are currently building and aiming at releasing is a very first step in the Hydra journey, right? Hydra Head is one of the first protocol of the whole Hydra family. We want also to get this right, right? And to make this as useful as possible for the community. So please engage with us on Discord, GitHub, or any media that, that is you know, the most convenient to you uh, because the feedback is crucial to build the right thing. Great. Thank you, Matthias. And all the links will be in the show notes below. Thank you very much, gentlemen. And we'll see you again very soon. So that's it for another month of the mid-month update. Please make sure you put in your diary the last Thursday of this month for the Cardano 360 full show. Thanks very much for joining us.